Welcome to Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda. 91 Albert Street in Winnipeg has a storied history in regards to the activist scene in the city. Not only was 91 Albert Street the home of the G7 Welcoming Committee record label featuring works by Propagandi, The Weaker Thans, Painted Thin, I Spy, Giant Sons, The Rebel Spell, Randy, Greg McPherson, Warsaw Pack, Malfaction, Clan Zoo, Submission Hold, Heretzikan, and more, but it was also the home to Arbiter Ring Publishing, which was co-founded by John K. Sampson. It also was the home to the often-mentioned Mondragon Cafe and Bookstore, which has come up on this podcast many times. And it was also the home to Natural Cycle Bike Shop and more. I think that Natural Cycle is actually still in business. Whenever I was in Winnipeg a few months back for the Propaganda October 2021 shows, I believe that that is uh, still in business. But anyway... A while back, I reached out to Mondragon co-founder Paul Burroughs to discuss Mondragon, the A-Zone collective housed within 91 Albert Street, his relationship with Propagandy and G7 Welcoming Committee Records, and his writing and reflections of his time with the collective. We touch on the concept of participatory economics. We talk about his chapter, uh, Paracon and Workers' Self-Management, Reflections on Winnipeg's Mondragon Bookstore and Coffeehouse Collective, which appears in the book Real Utopias, Participatory Society for the 21st Century from AK Press. And we also talk about his thoughts on the song Highly Salas Up Your Ass and Highly Does Hebron, which appear on How to Clean Everything and I'd Rather Be Flag Burning, respectively. We also talk about the vast range of organizations that have passed through the 91 Albert Street space over the years of its existence. So just a side note, This interview was slated to appear on the Highly Selass episode, but with our slightly modified pace on this podcast of late, I decided to release this chat with Paul Burroughs as a standalone bonus episode. I will also include this interview in the Highly Selass episode down the road, but I will remind listeners when we eventually do that episode that this particular interview appears in both episodes. I'm really delighted to feature Paul's story here, highlighting the history of the 91 Albert Street A-Zone, Mondragon, and G7 Welcoming Committee. The old A-Zone website is now archived, but you can find relevant links to the archived site at a-zone.org. There is also a seven-minute video featuring a tour of Mondragon in the show notes of this episode as a YouTube video. I really hope you enjoy this conversation with Paul Burroughs as a standalone bonus episode on Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda. So without further delay, please enjoy. Paul Burroughs, welcome to Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda. Thanks for having me. Paul, I'm so delighted to have you. Your um, your name and the things that you're associated with in Winnipeg have come up so many times on this show over the last several months, and I'm so excited to hear some of the stories um, that you'll tell tonight and uh, to talk about so many of the things that you've done to make that city uh, a special place where a band like Propaganda almost like flourishes in a way. Um, so can you just sort of introduce yourself to the audience a little bit, however you see fit, so they know about who you are and what you do? Okay. Um, Paul Burroughs. I'm born born and raised and mostly based in Winnipeg, um, Manitoba, which is Treaty 1 territory, homeland of the Cree and Anishinaabe nations, among others. And um, yeah, most people in Winnipeg know me from my days working at the Mondragon bookstore and coffee house uh, in the 90s and early 2000s. So that that's probably the shortest um, summary I could give you. <laughs> nice, nice. I love it. Well, Paul, we're going to get into a little bit about what makes uh, the Mondragon uh, a sort of a, a special place in a little while. But to me, whenever I've learned about the Mondragon and the the building that housed the cafe and bookstore, it seems like it is grounded in like a life of activism in several ways. 
And I'm curious if you can tell me a little bit about how your awareness of activism developed and what your path was like that led you into pursuing a life of activism in general. Where does that come from for you? Um, that goes back to the, to the eighties. Um, I started getting into the punk scene in the early eighties, but, uh, to be honest, didn't pay much, uh, attention to politics and the world beyond, uh, you know, my relatively privileged colonial bubble, um, <laughs> until my late teens, you know, um, I wouldn't say punk was a particularly political influence of mine except in a in an indirect sort of way uh through friends who were who were more politically aware and and conscientious than i was um and that's pretty much what what kind of drew me down more life-changing paths because i i dropped out of university in 1987 uh for example because i didn't really know why i was there mm -hmm. it, you know it wasn't inspiring me and so on, kind of on a whim, I decided to uh, accompany a couple friends to Central America. Mm. Um, and the goal was to do what, what was called, like, broadly speaking, witness for peace type work. Mm. Um, essentially premised on the idea that people could use, you know, the relative privilege of having an international passport and citizenship from a, from a state like Canada as a kind of um, solidarity buffer mm. that, that might help uh, mitigate human rights violations. Mm -hmm. um, El Salvador and Guatemala were kind of in the midst of brutal civil wars at the time. And, and both of them were run by essentially death squad regimes that uh, routinely carried out, you know, massacres of peasants and indigenous populations routinely murdered or disappeared union leaders and political opponents, uh, even murdered priests and nuns, all of which, you know, is fairly well documented for people that um, care to know about the facts. Mm -hmm. So without going into like a super long story, that experience, a year living in a war zone was kind of a watershed uh, and radicalizing experience for me personally. Um, one of my, one of the friends that I went with was almost killed by a grenade attack, mm. <laughs> um, by the Salvadoran military. So, and to this day, he's still has shrapnel in his body. Right. My goodness. And, um, uh, another experience from that period, like, you know, I, we met a Jesuit priest down there, you know, a man by the name of Ignacio Martin Barro, who had spoken really eloquently at, at one of the universities in um, San Salvador about the political context and uh, the popular movement against the dictatorship. And this guy um, that we had just met and, and heard talk about all this stuff was later uh, murdered by death squads himself. So, um, you know, anybody with a, a little bit of familiarity with the history knows about the killing of this guy and um, other outspoken Jesuits that happened in um, November 1989. Mm -hmm. um, but we had been, you know, fortunate enough to have met, you know, one of, one of these courageous voices and, and learned something about um, learn something about the situation um, from his perspective. And something about what was, you know, basically liberation theology. Mm -hmm. um, so that question of religion and its potential role, I guess, in a revolutionary context is something that we will return to later when we talk about today's propaganda song. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah. So overall, I think that was that was my introduction to kind of the nature of U.S. and Canadian imperialism, um, you know, which financed and armed and apologized for these death squad regimes. Uh, it was my introduction to corporate media propaganda, to ultimately to thinking about the world in structural terms. Mm. So in, 
so in a, in a sense, it was, it was my introduction to developing a, a systemic analysis instead of, you know, instead of just viewing everything, all social ills, all human rights violations, all injustices as being sort of uh, the result of bad apples. No, the system was working, you know, as intended. Mm -hmm. um, and so if I had to sum up the significance of that experience for me personally, it was just that, you know, becoming more attuned to the structural nature of uh, social ills. And um, by the time I got back to Winnipeg, I was a different person, you know, um, and activism became a central part of my life and uh, it started with Salvadoran politics and FMLN uh, which was the National Liberation Movement uh, you know support work and it kind of radiated out from there into other areas you know um, anti-apartheid work um, indigenous anti-colonial politics and so on um, but related to all of that, wanting to know, you know, what the hell I was talking about <laughs> was the, was uh, this newfound interest that I had on the part of, on you know, on my part in terms of uh, education, both yeah. self -ed self education and then university education. So so I kind of went back to school and started taking you know history courses, political studies courses things that might allow me to expand my own knowledge about, you know, Salvadoran history, Central American history, mm. indigenous, indigenous Mayan history. And, and related to all that Canadian and U S foreign policy. And, and then, you know, ultimately comparative global histories of, of imperialism and settler colonialism and revolution and that sort of thing. You know, what, so what, uh, yeah. what, what year did you get back to Winnipeg after these experiences that were so transformative um, for you? That was, um, I guess, 1988 or so. Right? Okay. So yeah. when, and, yeah, what did you do when you got back? So you're going to university. Were you like involved in music at all whenever you got back and were doing these university years post El Salvador? Um, yeah, like in, in in terms of the Winnipeg music scene and stuff. Is mm -hmm. that mean? Yeah. Um, I was sort of involved in in the scene in a in you know just as a an observer of shows and stuff. Like yeah. going back to, going back to the early '80s up until about the early '90s. Really, I kind of drifted away from it after I became an activist. Mm -hmm. Not not so much for a particular reason as just, you know, kind of having less time and my priorities started to shift a bit in my twenties. Um, nice. But yeah, I was big into the punk scene as a teenager. I mean, I, and a bit beyond and went to all the shows that were here, you know, black flag and DOA and SNFU, dead Kennedys, GBH, Cro-Mags, circle jerks, all that stuff. Love it. And um, all of those came through Winnipeg, um, some of them, you know, repeatedly. And um, local Winnipeg bands from the back in the day, like Stretch Marks and The Unwanted and Joe Puke and the Chunky Bits. And, uh, yeah. I'm, uh, uh, it's hilarious because I'm reading Sheldon yeah. Bernie's book right now, uh, Missing Like Teeth, right. about the Winnipeg music scene. And so all, you're saying all these things, and I'm like thinking like, oh, yeah, Sheldon wrote about that in this chapter and that chapter. So I'm like making all these little connections right now because, you know, context for a band like Propaganda and Winnipeg itself as a city is so central to the story. So it's so awesome to hear your observations mm -hmm about you know your path and what was inspiring you but then also why this city was you know special as a part of the story as well you know what i mean yeah absolutely and for a while there i i also dabbled a bit in in like uh, the promotion side of things too like um you know bringing in the forgotten rebels for their first two shows in winnipeg for example starting in like 1986 nice um 
but uh, that was kind of before I was particularly astute in a political sense. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I and I was also, you know, messed around a bit back in that at that time too, like 85, 86 with, uh, with my own punk band, like with a few friends. Right. Nice. You know, we had, we called ourselves Jolt after the cola. So, um, you know, all the sugar, twice the caffeine. And, you know, we had our, we had our own jokes about like all the ego and twice the booze and, you know, or something to that effect. Um, so I was, and I was the singer in that cause I couldn't play anything else really. So, mm -hmm. uh, we played basement parties and a couple shows at places like the Royal Albert Arms and yeah. the West the West End Cultural Center and stuff like that. And it was lots and lots of fun and we weren't particularly good. But, you know, I'd say energy was kind of like our biggest asset. <laughs> and mostly we just played covers of songs like punk and metal tunes that we kind of liked and it was kind of short lived. Um, but some of the guys that we that I played with, you know, went on and became good musicians and you know um and are still playing music so i love it but uh, um but yeah by the or by the early 90s sorry i had kind of drifted away from kind of a direct involvement in the music scene like and stopped going to see shows really on a regular basis unless i had a friend in the band you know yeah um so i, I just spent more and more time engaged in other things and activism and in my and in education and stuff like that. So nice. Well, before we get into what you did go on to do yeah. with, uh, with the cafe and the bookstore, um, how did you first become aware of like propaganda? Like, cause I know that you sort of shared space with them later on, but I'm wondering about how you became right. aware of what they were doing as a band, um, maybe as far back as you can remember. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I got, I got into them. Um, in a different way, I suspect, than most people, right? I mean, I knew they existed in, um, you know, because I'd see their name on band posters mm -hmm. throughout the city over the years. Um, but because I wasn't really, you know, going out to see shows a, lo a lot, um, I didn't really know much else about them, about their musical style or their politics, really, until I met uh, Chris and Jordan and John um, sometime really in the winter of 95, six, mm. um, through the A zone, through the Winnipeg A zone. So I never got into them as a, you know, first and foremost, kind of as a fan of their music. I got, I got to know them first and foremost as fellow travelers in a political and activist sense. Um, Wonderful. and that, that's how we got to know each other. They were anti, anti-racists. They were anti-fascists. They were self-identified anarchists. Mm -hmm. Right. And so for me, their music was kind of a secondary thing. Uh, it was their politics that mattered, right? And I was kind of at that stage in my life where I honestly couldn't really have cared less about, <laughs> about their music, really, or any music, not just theirs. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, they were, they were all smart and thoughtful and funny and friendly anarchists, right? For, yeah. who, for from my perspective, also had this other thing that they did on the side, you know, their music. So, so yeah, I didn't, I didn't really come to them as a fan. Um, you know, they became friends and compatriots and fellow travelers on a different kind of journey, right? Like they were participants in the political and cultural sort of workshop that, that was the A zone in those days. Um, and, and I became a fan, but it was more because of that pre-existing uh, friendship and political camaraderie, not the other way around. Um, it's funny because I, I do remember, I, my, my memory might be a bit foggy here, but as to the timing exactly, but, but I do remember a couple early interactions that are kind of illustrative of that. Because at one point during that winter, um, that first winter, nine, like 95, six, Chris and, uh, and so here's where it's foggy. Cause I can't remember now if it was George or John that came with him, but they came up to the A zone office, uh, you know, that we had on the second floor uh, to talk about renting space or getting a membership in the building. Like, cause we had like on the second floor, what we used to call the Emma Goldman grassroots center 
you know, it was a communal space on the second floor of the 91 Albert Street, uh, you know, for activist groups to share, you know, resources, plan activities, uh, hold events and so on. And that was before Mondragon had opened, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I can't remember all the details, but I do remember they, they brought me a copy, a vinyl copy of How to Clean Everything. Nice. Um, and another disc that I don't remember it, you know, it may have been like, I'd rather be flag burning or it was probably flag burning. Yeah. Cause that was, or, that was brand new in that, in that year. Yeah. It might've been that or where quality is job number one. I, I don't really remember what that was, but the other one was less talk hadn't even come out yet. Mm -hmm. Um, so they brought me these samples, uh, not because they thought I was actually interested in the music per se, mm. they, but because they wanted them to stand as a kind of political portfolio. Um, and so that kind of in a nutshell is how I first heard their music. It was, it was meant as a kind of political resume <laughs> so that the yeah. band might be, might be welcomed into the space at 91 Albert street, not, not really as a band so much as, as an activist project in its own right. Mm. You know? and that is that's so sort cool. of yeah that's how i was introduced to the to their actual music you know yeah well i know that um the mondragon cafe and bookstore was you know where you worked from 1996 to 2001 but it sounds like the a zone predates that which i didn't know um and so, you know, I, I want to talk a little more, bit more about the the philosophy of participatory economics that guides a lot of the work that you've done. But before we get to the theoretical stuff, I want to know just a little bit about the the setting of the A Zone building and like what the story is behind the building itself. If you can tell like why it was founded and all those things, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, it predates it. Um not by much because they were all, they were always sort of meant to be, um, um, they, they were mutually reinforcing sort of sides of the, of the equation, I guess. Right. But yeah, it started in about 1995. So not, not much earlier. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so how did you get like the space and like kind of what was like the the motivating uh, catalyst for 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 doing this project that becomes what is known throughout Winnipeg as the A Zone building? Um, well, the basic idea was just to get like minded um, social justice and grassroots and socialist and anarchist and anti racist groups to to sort of share space uh, to pool resources and energies. Um, even just to aid in the most minimal efforts at kind of networking, becoming aware of what other people are doing, helping build a, a sort of culture of activism and, and resistance, mm -hmm. um, you know, because the Mondragon side of it, too, arose in a, in a specific context where Winnipeg no longer had an alternative bookstore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there had been an old left communist run one called Co-op. Uh, mm -hmm. downtown and there had been a feminist bookstore called um bold print in osborne village but both of the both of those went uh under in the early 90s creating this kind of void right um you know finding alternative books and magazines and so on was really hard to do before the internet <laughs> was much mm -hmm. of a thing and uh might seem kind of somewhat hard for people to understand now that have grown up with Wi-Fi and social media and <laughs> internet, internet news outlets and yeah. online and online bookstores too. Right. Like, yeah. Cause it was a lot harder back then to get a hold of uh, alternative material information. Um, you basically needed little leftist and feminist bookstores um, to kind of have uh, regular access. And that void was one of the things that we set out to try to fill by, by starting Mondragon and the A Zone, and the two of them were kind of essentially related to one another. The um, the vegetarian side of the of Mondragon, for example, was you know indicative of our food politics, but on a more 
practical level, we, we just thought it would be, you know, it would help to keep the bookstore afloat. Um, it would help to have a place where you could get coffee, food, beer, wine, mm -hmm. you know, sit by the fire or listen to a guest speaker. And um, yeah. And so the whole idea of the, of the larger building was about sharing resources and space. And um, that's kind of more or less what we did. And um, the different aspects of the two, uh, you know, the, the cafe and the building as a whole, it kind of reinforced one another when things finally did start to take off. I love it. Well, and your, your cafe has come up on the show before. Um, there was an episode we did with uh, Lindsay McDougall, who is the guitar player for the Australian band Frenzel Ram. And on our Humane Meat episode, Lindsay says that when he was in Winnipeg, he had, uh, I think he said it was tempeh bacon. And he's <laughs> like, I think I had tempeh bacon for the first time in Winnipeg at the bookstore underneath G7. And then we had to like look up the name and he's like, oh, Mondragon, that was it. And so your, your cafe has come up on the show before and you wrote an essay that uh, I really loved that I read the other day that in a, in a book volume. Um, and the, the essay that you wrote is called Real, uh, the book is called Real Utopia. And the essay you wrote is called Par Econ and Workers Self-Management, Reflections on Winnipeg's Mondragon Bookstore and Coffee House Collective. And I love that you have the word par econ in the title of this chapter that you wrote. And I'm wondering if you can say kind of what par econ theory is, and then we'll get into like what that looks like on a practical level with running the Mondragon Cafe and Bookstore. So like, tell me about the theory first, and then we'll talk about the practice. Right. Um, that's funny, because I actually, Paracon is not actually an acronym that I'm particularly fond of. Mm. <laughs> so, and I was kind of, when I, when I actually submitted my paper to, uh, for the, for that chapter, mm -hmm. I, I wrote it out, <laughs> part, participatory economics in full, yeah. right? on purpose because I didn't want to use the acronym and the, and the, uh, and Chris, the Chris Spanos, the guy who uh, edited the anthology, he changed it to Paracon. And I was like, <laughs> damn you, <laughs> damn you. Cause I tend, I tend to say it in full because so just so that people who are unfamiliar with it, with it will at least have some kind of clue as to what's being talked about for without sure. Need, you know, without needing to know what this particular acronym means. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it refers to a particular economic model that was first uh, conceptualized by uh, economist Robin Hanel and, and uh, Z Magazine, Znet writer Michael Albert. Um, you know, and it's not something that was invented out of whole cloth from the minds of these dudes, but it, it sort of comes from a very long line of left revolutionary socialist and anarchist thinking going back really to the 19th century. Um, but they, they took what they understood to be sort of the best of those diverse traditions. Um, you know, the lessons learned by historical movements and revolutionary struggles and discarded what they thought kind of needed to be abandoned and added a few innovative elements of their own to come up with a, you know, a particular vision of how a, a worker's self-managed and democratic economy might actually function mm -hmm. in a, in a post-capitalist future. But the basic idea of the model is pretty straightforward. It kind of asks you what, you know, what values and principles do we want to actually uphold in an economy, you know, like equity, diversity, self-management, uh, efficiency, ecological sustainability, and so on. And then it proposes a number of um, institutional features that might actually promote and uphold those values and principles that we claim to want. Mm. Um, so overall, I think the model tries to suggest that people should have decision-making power um, accrue in proportion to the degree one is affected by a given type of decision. Um, we don't need to go into too much detail about that, but it's mm -hmm. basically, it's, it's not actually the same kind of thing as, as what 
we're used to, like when we talk about, say, one person, one vote or mm-hmm. or a more majoritarian voting mechanism where somebody might have where you might need 51 percent of a voting body to ram through some policy. And then the other 49 percent might be against it. You know, it's it's kind of very different from that. It's also very different from consensus models that are that are popular in some activist circles. Um but in any case, it, it's a different kind of principle at work um, that the authors felt allowed for a kind of a more profound form of democracy, really. Mm. Um, and in terms of the institutional features uh, that might satisfy those values, um, they proposed some things like uh, nested producers and consumers councils. Uh, something they call balanced job complexes, um, remuneration according to effort and sacrifice and also need, and a participatory planning mechanism instead of capitalist markets and instead of centrally planned statist planning mechanisms, mm. the, kind, the kind of stuff that was utilized in the old Soviet Union. Mm-hmm. In other words, a kind of a third way, right? A democratic participatory way to plan our collective economic activities and to do things like reconcile um, aggregate supply and demand, um, to come up with relative prices that would actually take into account real social and ecological costs rather than systematically distort those costs. Um in other words, it's a rational democratic planning mechanism that's neither capitalist nor state communist. Mm-hmm. Right. So those are the basic features of the model. Um, and without getting into <laughs> too much detail or into the debates that have arisen around them, you know, there's dozens of books like on this, like by sure. Albert and Hanel, you know, that co-authored or separate. Uh, the first one I ever read was called Looking Forward, which was published by South End Press way back in 1991-ish, I think. Um, it's still not a bad place to start, really, if people, nice. are, if, if people are kind of interested in these ideas. We have a lot uh, of readers it, in our listenership. Yeah, it's, you know, it's the, it's the book that first got me thinking about workplace democracy and, and economics in a serious way. Um, meaning in a way that wasn't just like polemical, but had concrete elements to it, like yeah. that you could, that you could, you know, sink your teeth into. And it definitely influenced the way we set about building our own collective workplace at Mondragon in, in 1995. Well, that's what I want to know um, about next. Um, like when you put this into practice, this theory, tell me about organizing this business around a post-capitalist model of Paracon and what made the day-to-day running of Mondragon so unique and special as far as businesses go. Um, in terms of meshing theory and practice, it was kind of trial by fire. Like mm-hmm. just, just as starting any business really is. We had lots of ideas, lots of enthusiasm, but, uh, not so much in the way of business experience. Yeah. And, uh, and capitalism is kind of an unforgiving educator mm-hmm. when it comes to, at the best of times, I guess, um, even when you're not trying to operate things in a different way than is normally done. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that article you mentioned, I go into a lot of the theory versus the day-to-day practice in some detail in there, but, um, but Briefly, like some aspects of the model were relatively easy to flesh out at the workplace level. Like we had, you know, we we had workers council Mm -hmm. um, that collectively made all general policies and overarching decisions in the workplace. And that was easy enough to do. The only thing that that varied really was the frequency and the nature of the meetings themselves. Right. And then we also had balanced job complexes. Uh, in which we sought to balance the desirable and the undesirable work tasks, uh, the empowering and the rote tasks, the intellectual and the manual, the typically managerial and the typically employee work, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it, that's what it means uh, more or less to have balanced job complexes. You don't have to have the typical hierarchical 
division of labor between the givers and the takers of orders. So there's no bosses uh, whatsoever because we're all collectively making the decisions that affect us. Mm -hmm. And we're all in some senses holding one another accountable for the things we've collectively and individually agreed to do. Mm -hmm. So that was really the biggest innovation really, because most workplaces don't actually try to balance work in fair and equitable, equitable ways. Right. Um, even sadly, a lot of places that imagine them, themselves to be progressive minded or even radical left, right? It's just surprising how common that is that even among leftist groups, you know, to default to what are essentially classist and patriarchal divisions of labor, right? Right. Um, and we wanted the default to be something else, something inherently feminist and inherently non hierarchical and balance job complexes while not necessarily being sufficient to that task. They're a good entry point into thinking about uh, that in concrete terms, you know, how to actually prioritize and carry out some of those aims at a structural level inside, not just a business, but really any organization um, for that matter, anywhere that you have decisions um that need to be made and tasks that need to be done you know um the idea of balancing the work fairly um is something that's uh, important right mm. so for us it was it was about figuring out how to create and tweak that tweak our particular balanced job complexes you know it, for our particular workplace like as a retail bookstore as a restaurant environment um as a political and activist venue, right? We had our, we had specific tasks that had to get done. Um, you know, so we had a collective of uh, 10 members initially when we opened in 96. And we wanted to just ensure that the net, all the necessary tasks of the business were um, divided as equally as possible and that pay was also equal. Mm. Um, and if something didn't work, we wanted everyone to feel like sufficiently knowledgeable and empowered to be able to articulate a problem and propose a solution and to be able to change things if it didn't work, right? That was the basic idea, right? Like, mm -hmm. It's not enough to have a formal equal right to speak if, if you don't have the knowledge and the skills and the training and the ability to sort of um, to speak to an issue because you, because you don't necessarily have a full overview of, of what's required in the workplace. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there were, and there were problems of, uh, you know, trying to pull off all this stuff, not so much with the, with the kind of values and the aspirations that we had, but just in terms of the day-to-day -day grind, you know, like the, the effort and the burnout, the the interpersonal conflicts, the the less than stellar pay that we were able to provide, mm -hmm. you know, and so on. Because at the end of the day, we were still, you know, this fast paced retail work environment in the midst of capitalism. And yeah. in many respects, you know, we were creating more work for ourselves than less simply because we were trying to build an alternative that none of us were necessarily prepared for you know mm. yeah yeah that's interesting um this is a you know a different type of thinking about business than than i've ever experienced and so it's really inspiring that you would try something different and in such a way i mean it's just really fascinating to hear about like i'm i'm learning so much just from your essay and from talking to you right now this is all really new to me but you know i'm also curious about like what the participation was like with the other tenants in the building. Like I know there's uh, John K. Sampson's publishing business. I know there was a bike shop. I know there was G7 welcoming committee. And I'm wondering if you can tell me about like what the relationship was like across the different groups in the building that were above and below the Mondragon. Right. Yeah. There were lots of diverse groups in the building over the years. Mm -hmm. Um, G7 and Arbiter were two that consciously, <clears throat> excuse me, consciously also adopted a, 
a kind of participatory economic workplace structure. Mm-hmm. Um, Natural Cycle, Bike Shop, and Courier was also a cooperative. Um, but there was lots of groups in that space at one, one time or another. Liberty Library and then Junto Local 91 Library were upstairs. Mm-hmm. Uh, Canadian Dimension Magazine, um, the Manitoba Action Committee on the Status of Women, Anarchist Black Cross, Prisoner Support, uh, Food Not Bombs, People Acting Against Men's Violence. Amazing. Canada-Palestine Support Network. There was a Central American uh, Community Center. Uh, Winnipeg Cop Watch was in there. Uh, Amnesty International was in there for a while. Amazing. And uh, there was a Women in Trades and Technology Co-op. Uh, Okijida Warriors Society was there. And then there was, a, there was also Urban Shaman, an Aboriginal art gallery. Uh, they started out in this space. Um, when they first started out, uh, Rudolph Rocker Cultural Center. So, no doubt, I'm. I'm. There's countless others. I'm probably forgetting because there were so amazing. Lots I didn't of, know any, lots I of didn't, little small groups. I didn't know any of this. This is great. Yeah, yeah. It was, and it was fairly diverse, right? In terms of uh, background, political ideology, and focus of all of these groups. Um, but that was kind of half the point, right? To get people to recognize. Um, diverse but sometimes shared struggles, get people talking to one another to create a community to share resources and hopefully foster not just feelings of solidarity, but practices of solidarity, right? And because all of these groups worked in the building, they would also, you know, inevitably, uh, people would wander into the cafe on the main floor and um, and um, have their lunch or get their coffee or have a snack. And the place had a fairly lively comradely feel for the most part because of, because of that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. What are, um, what are you most proud of, of those years at Mondragon? What is like your, your biggest standout proud moments about achieving? Um, In a general sense, I think, like I'm proud of of having contributed to that kind of lively, comradely political and social culture, uh, and tried to do so in a way that put into practice sort of the political vision we professed to actually believe in. You know, mm-hmm. to make our means consistent with our ends. And right, that's something and, I struggle with. You know, yeah, we all do. We all yeah. do. It's an ongoing, it's a lifelong struggle, um, you know, and we didn't get everything right. Obviously there was, there were inevitable problems, personal conflicts that didn't always get handled the way they should have or political failures and mistakes in some fashion or another. But, you know, we did create a democratic worker self-managed collective and it provided a lot of books and a lot of magazines over the years, you know, and it hosted a lot of book launches and, guest speakers and panel debates on a wide range of topics over the years. You know, the roster of names of people and groups that went through Mondragon or the building and spoke to, you know, sometimes standing room only audiences is huge, right? Like, Mm. well, not all those people are still around, you know, like the late Alexander Coburn, for example, or, um, you know, representatives from, you know, the landless peasants movement in Brazil or like, like literally just all over the world, right? People people involved in stuff. So every speaker that we brought in, I think, to engage with people over, you know, an almost 20 year period was at least I view as a kind of victory of sorts, right? In some small, in some small way. And, um, and so in that sense, I think we did help kind of raise a generation of people in some respects who learned about, you know, worker self-management, not just by reading about it, but also by doing it and learned about a lot of topics from, you know, local and global issues. Um, And it was, you know, it was messy and we made a lot of mistakes, but we also had the, had the power to kind of change direction, which is not necessarily something that a lot of people 
you know, with experience in left institutions or in mainstream or even radical unions can necessarily say, you know, mm -hmm. people, um, people don't always feel like they can change the things that the, the, the groups that they're involved in, um, in, in positive direction. And a lot of the people who were involved in one way or another, I think went on, you know, they went on to form other groups or join other collectives. Um, and so the, those ripples carry on in ways that are difficult to quantify really. Like, yeah. um, you know, one of our founding members at Mondragon works at AK Press in California. Um, you know, one went on to do, to, to, I think worked at another publisher in New York City. Um, you know, th those kinds of things. They're hard to quantify, but. Sure. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, and you know, every time Mondragon comes up on the podcast, it's always spoken about in a very endearing and nostalgic way. Like whenever, uh, I don't know if you know Lauren Corman, but she's from the area and she was on our uh, Nailing Descartes to the Wall episode. And she talked a lot about her work with, um, you know, like environmental studies with regards to animal slaughter and the animal industrial complex. But she spoke very highly of Mondragon back back when she was, you know, younger and like going to shows in Winnipeg and the importance of this place. Um, so people talk about it very lovingly. And, you know, I'm wondering if you can just tell the story behind the closure and the end of Mondragon and like why that all happened the way it did. Um, the closure. Yeah. Why did it all end? Um, well, I guess for starters, that's something that happened a fairly long time after I left the collective oh, okay. to, do other to do other things. Um, but I, I guess in a general sense, it's hard to necessarily attribute it to one specific thing. I think it's too easy to, or convenient to, um, you know, to just go to lay all the blame on capitalism or something. <laughs> Um, though I'm generally happy to blame capitalism for, <laughs> for a lot of things, yeah, for everything, yeah. from, everything from imperialism and more to the number of pandemic deaths over the last year mm -hmm. to the, you know, to the fact that my light bulbs occasionally burn out. Um, but, um, but I think an honest assessment would, would also have to include like a, a more critical component. Like there were some failures of vision and practice, you know, I, I think at both the political and business levels that played roles as well. It's a, it's a complicated thing and not without its inevitable sort of hard feelings for some of the people involved. I think, um, you know, I've been mulling over the possibility of writing, like writing sort of a quote unquote autopsy to, uh, to speak about these sorts of questions and mm -hmm. draw upon, draw upon um, oral interviews with collective members involved like at all stages of the lifespan of the uh, of the workplace but um yeah but that's probably i mean that's all maybe all i feel confident about saying because mm -hmm. i think i think it does have a political relevance though like it's you know in order to be useful and relevant you know that we have to get that right though you know, like being being easy on ourselves, you know, and insisting on rose colored glasses when it comes to our own political weaknesses doesn't necessarily help anyone out in the future. Right. If that yeah. makes sense. <laughs> well, um, where is your life taking you post Mondragon? Well, what have you done in the years since you since this all ended? Because this is years ago at this point. So where where have you gone since? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, yeah, because I left there around 2002-ish, right? And I think for a while, I, I, I went with uh, my partner at that time. We went out to Montreal and lived there for a year. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I became a parent. My son was born in 2005. Now he's about to learn how to drive, right? Nice. Time flies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I went back to school after a dozen years away from university. Um and got a master's in history. Nice. And um, 
And I'm also, in theory, I'm finishing a PhD in history too, but that's kind of on an indefinite hold right now. Um, life, life, work, parenting, health, pretty much all, all other priorities have, you know, kind of become increasingly more important to me than finishing the damn dissertation. Yeah. <laughs> but, oh. it, you know, in one way, yeah, in one way or another, I've, I've like maintained that interest in, in history and in politics that I first developed, like in Central America way back yeah. in the eighties, right? Like whether it's my own university research or um, teaching courses as a sessional lecturer, uh, taking on short-term or long-term research contracts, or just writing, yeah, writing writing something with an historical element to it, right? On social media or on on my newish my newish blog. <laughs> nice. You know, his history's been kind of like the common thread running through much of my life. So, um, and right now I'm still I'm kind of toying with formalizing like a research focus. Uh, by starting up a research organization that I'm calling like stolen ground research collective mm -hmm. tentatively, tentatively, you know, a reference to settler colonialism and, and treaty violations and dispossession in North mm. America. Um, but that's in its kind of conceptual and infancy stage. So nice. I don't want to, I don't want to say too much about that, but that's fine. Well, that's the, that's the short and sweet of it. <laughs> I love it. Well, Paul, whenever I reached yeah. out to you about doing this show ages ago, I always make guests choose a particular song for an episode that they want to be on. Um, so I want to, you know, segue a little bit into talking about some music for a few minutes, but you're yeah. on the episode for highly Salas up your ass slash highly does Hebron <laughs> the episode of this podcast. So we have highly Salas up your ass from how to clean everything and highly does Hebron from the, I'd rather be flag burning. I spy split 10 inch. And what is it about this particular song that stands out to you in the propaganda canon? Why did you choose this song? Um, well, for starters, it's on the album that I first listened to. Mm -hmm. um, that Chris brought to the A Zone office is, you know, that political resume. Yeah. Um, so long ago, right? <laughs> 20, 26 odd years ago or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, so, but also maybe unlike most propaganda fans, maybe unlike Chris himself, you know, I still have kind of a soft spot for how to clean everything. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, you know, don't get me wrong, that soft spot, doesn't necessarily have you know much to do with musicianship or production values or even with lyrical content per se right but i just have the i've always had uh, personally a soft spot for for what you know i might i might call you might classify as melodic pop punk mm -hmm. right in some fashion or another right i've always loved the popular doa songs like general strike or you know, they're, they're slow ones like War in the East and always love the Clash. Always love the precursors of the Clash, like the 101ers, Generation X and, you know, the Ramones and Iggy Pop and Buzzcocks. Yeah. Uh, the Vibrators or the Saints, you know, lots of that, lots of that stuff that's pretty poppy and um, by today's standards, right? Or even melodic stuff that Alice Cooper did, right? If you know, stuff like that. So to me, how to clean everything kind of had that classical pop punk feel to it that, that I grew up with as a teenager. Right. And, and so, yeah, I genuinely, I genuinely do like that. Uh, like it in those terms, right. It's, nice. it's raw, it's raw. It's got like some catchy, but simple little riffs and it's got some catchy melodies and phrases that are kind of funny and in your face. Right. And so Haile Selassie in particular jumped out at me just because, you know, both because of its, its consistently slower tempo and, uh, and because of its unmistakable lyrics. Um, I liked it kind of from the get-go, even though I thought its lyrics were a little reductionist. <laughs> mm. so, so, yeah, that's kind of why, it's, why it jumped out. What does the song teach you or ask you to consider as a listener? Um, 
Well, if, I mean, if I had to zero in on a on a on a message, I guess, or, or messages, I think it does a few things, or it's it seems to do a few things to me simultaneously. One, you know, it it seems to be using Rastafarianism as a, a kind of proxy for the absurdity of all religion, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and two, you know, in tying this critique of Rastafarianism to occupied Palestine in the contents of the song, it seems to be suggesting that the Palestinian, Palestinian conflict with Israel as a state um, sort like sort of boils down to religion is basically sort of one of the implications or it, you, it's legitimate to read it that way. And, um, and three, it sort of goes on in the closing lines, right. To link Zionism, militarism, nationalism, religion. Um, but in a way that really does highlight religion, like religion is the opening target of the song and fuck religion is the closing refrain. Mm-hmm. So it, so it's definitely the central theme. Right. And Ultimately, it's a catchy in-your-face song, and it's designed obviously to be provocative. Yeah. Um, but but I do think it's like I I mean personally, I just think it's important to emphasize that that I doubt like I doubt very much that any of the band would write such lyrics today, or like at least in the partic- in the particular way that it's done, um, in a sort of a, a more reductionist fashion, and I. I think for starters, their their views on religion have softened somewhat. I think perhaps. they've shifted a lot. Yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, perhaps even significantly. Yeah. So there's still plenty, you know, there's still plenty to say fuck religion about. But mm-hmm. I, you know, you know, and I recall having arguments with Chris about some of this stuff, you know, way back in the mid to late 90s, right? Like, I'm an atheist myself. So is he, obviously, or he, you know, I don't know if he still considers himself that, but, you know, we had a section in the bookstore, right, at Mondragon on liberation theology, for example, that talked about some of the revolutionary struggles in which religion played not just like a less nefarious role, but actually or arguably a liberatory one. Yeah. You know, all over Latin America, there's been two types of Christianity, right? A reactionary, pro-oligarchic, regressive Christianity and its antithesis ranging from kind of like the church of the prefer- preferential option of the poor, which was the term used in liberation theology, to like outright gun-toting guerrilla priests of various national liberation mm-hmm. movements, like like Camilo Torres in Colombia. Right. Um, so the kinds of priests like Martin Barra, who I mentioned earlier, that was that was murdered, you know, that the Salvadoran state felt compelled to murder precisely because they did stand up for the oppressed, you know? Mm. So I think those kinds of arguments, um, you know, whatever, whatever impact and drunken, uh, drunken sort of argument over at the pub uh, can, can really have. Um, But also like the, the really grotesque ways in which like, you know, some of the so-called new atheists, um, you know, whether it was Dawkins or Hitchens, Harris or, you know, Bill Maher, you know, these really smug voices who just happily played into Western imperialist and war on terror narratives. You know, I think that probably played a big role, too. Right. Because mm. I think the treatment of the religion of religion in the band's lyrics, right, has comes out very differently in later work. Right. Whether it's like the critique of Hitchens. <laughs> yeah in uh you know comply resist which isn't necessarily about religion per se but or it's the respect for timorese activists like bella galos in mate camoris mm-hmm. or uh or the buddhist monk right like like Kang yeah, take Duk- duck, yeah. In, yeah in in um cop just out of frame so i think all of that in my mind is kind of indicative of a very different approach to talking about both spirituality and religion uh, and that sort of thing. And similarly, I think the, I think the band's views on, uh, you know, their views on the nature of the Palestinian struggle have also changed and, and become far more sophisticated really Mm -hmm. since the, this album came out like almost 30 years ago now. Right. Um, You know, religion is not the root of the Palestinian conflict. 
It's about land. It's about colonialism, dispossession, apartheid, you know, and yeah, nationalism and militarism, which are referred to in the song, do play a role, but it's multifaceted and uh, it's primarily about settler colonial dynamics backed by Western power and religion has been a relatively minor player, right? Yeah. In fact, both both the Zionist movement and the Palestinian like national liberation struggle have been primarily secular going all the way back to the 19th century. Um, so having said all that, you know, I still like the song. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm still more than happy to yell, you know, fuck all the isms at the end of it. But, uh, you know, but I, I do think the band, the band, uh, you know, Chris's lyric writing and everybody's political sort of uh, analysis of things has, has definitely gotten, uh, you know, it's gotten a lot better over the years as, as it should, as it should amongst all of us, as we get older and read more and learn more and interact with the world uh, more. Mm. So, yeah. Well, Paul, I just have one more question for you. Um, You know, you, you came at this band from a slightly different angle than a lot of listeners out there. Almost first is like, you know, like work colleagues in a way, as opposed to like listening and consuming the records and like your teenage years, like many of us did. Right. So you may have a different answer to this question than a lot of other guests, but what does a band like propaganda mean to you as a person who cares about the world and making society better for all people? What is this sort of band, you know, what does this symbolize to you? Right. Yeah, coming to coming to this question more as a friend and comrade than as mm-hmm. a fan per se. Um, but I can still say, you know, I've genuinely kind of loved watching these guys hone their craft over the years and become basically <laughs> worldwide rock stars in some yeah. in some in some respects, right? It's <laughs> honestly it's very uh I find it very satisfying and rewarding to me to see these guys who I love as people, Yeah, you know, um, and, you know, who I know have, have truly the utmost humility and integrity, right. Mm-hmm. Um, to see them excel at their craft. It's great. It's great. And the fact that so many people around the world have been influenced by them and, you know, to look more deeply into some of the most uh, pressing social and political questions of the day, to think um, critically about our role and culpability in in structures of violence and oppression, uh, to think about how to challenge those things. That's just fantastic. Like, um, I can take absolutely zero credit for any of it, but I couldn't be more proud of these uh, Winnipeg uh, compañeros, right, and mm-hmm. and now uh, Sulin with, um, but um, but yeah, it's been lovely to watch it all unfold over the last quarter century or more, right? Fantastic. Mm. Well, Paul Burroughs, <laughs> I have absolutely loved hearing your stories um, tonight. I think that this is such an important piece of telling the story of propaganda because you were there in a different way, and. The cafe has come up on the show several times at this point. So hearing it right from your mouth directly is just such a thrill, such a treat. And I'm just so grateful to you for hanging out with me tonight to tell the story of the Mondragon and the A-Zone. It's just awesome, man. It's been an honor to be here. Um, Thanks for having me. It's been great. Between the 